Hey, Deliberate Leaders, I am your host, Allison Dunn, executive coach and founder of the Deliberate Leaders podcast dedicated to helping leaders build strong, thriving businesses. Each episode, we feature inspiring interviews to help you on your leadership journey, and I'm super excited to introduce our guest today. We have with us Jerome DeRoy, who is the CEO of Narrative. Um, he is passionate about the power of storytelling for business. For the past 13 years, Jerome has worked closely with clients to craft business relevant personal stories for sales, leadership, team building. He regularly lectures at Parsons New School of Design in New York City on the art of storytelling. Jerome, thank you so much for joining us here today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I, um, I like to kick these off with a deliberate conversation. Um, would you mind sharing your number one leadership tip with our listeners? Mm. Well, uh, at the risk of maybe repeating some what some of your other guests might have said, um, listening for me is the number one tip for leaders, um, because without listening, there can be no story to tell. And that's what I'm all about is storytelling. And I want the stories to be impactful. But if nobody's listening, no matter how great your story is, uh, wonderful your presentation is, and you've got great visuals and you've rehearsed it, uh, you know, to no end, if you show up and it doesn't land and nobody's listening to you, then it won't have any impact. So that's my number one tip is keep listening and don't take listening for granted. Just do it. Jerome, I will share with you, no one has ever said listening as their number one leadership tip. Right. <laughs> and, and I would say as a coach, that is my number one tip. So I like, I like the way that you think. That's fantastic. Great. great. <laughs> um, so you, um, you work with um, leaders to really help them figure out how to do storytelling as a way um, to increase um, their leadership, their sales, their employee engagement. Mm. Talk, talk me through that process a little bit. I mean, is there a science to it? Well, for sure. I mean, you know, storytelling itself, we, we think of it as an art. We think of it as a, perhaps a talent uh, that some people have and some people don't have. The truth is uh, that it's actually a science. And, uh, and the reason I, I can say that with such confidence is that um, there have been studies, many studies, as a matter of fact, on the human brain and uh, establishing the connection between people who were listening to stories. So they put them in uh, MRIs and, and CAT scans, and they looked at what was going on in the brain. And they noticed that certain wires were firing when you were listening to a story, and the same wires were firing when you were telling a story. So we know that storytelling is actually something that the brain responds to. And it sort of explains why when you are listening to a really good story or watching a great movie, whatever it might be, you cannot help but want to know what happens next. If you get interrupted, it's going to become really, really frustrating. And so that's the science behind it is that our, our brains are actually hardwired for storytelling. And that's kind of the foundation for everything we do. So from there, what we simply do is help people harness what the brain naturally understands. The brain naturally understands story structure. It knows what a cliffhanger looks like. It knows what a good hook at the beginning looks like. It knows what resolution looks like. Not only does it know what it looks like, but it looks for those things. So that if you have someone who's going on and on and on, and not getting to the resolution of the story, the brain becomes very frustrated and we become kind of, uh, you know, we, we need to know, we become impatient and we need to know what, what how is this going to end? What's the point of this? Okay. Um, how, if, so you're saying everyone naturally is a storyteller in some way, mm -hmm. um, yeah. some good, some bad. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Um, in helping someone work through what their story for their business uh, might be, like, could you just kind of walk us through an example sure. structure of what that would be? Yeah, so so we have a particular method at, at Narrative, my company, and um, and and we have a book called Powered by Storytelling, which is uh, which is essentially our method distilled into chapters. So each chapter is a step of the method. Mm 
And so I'll walk you through a couple of those steps, um, but there's sort of two real cornerstones of this without going into too much detail. Whenever we engage with someone, we, I'm gonna go back to what I said at the beginning. Uh, we work first on listening. We don't go right away. Uh, our process is not to sort of ask someone to tell a story right away and, and critique it, you know, uh, and I'm going to be Simon Cowell and you're going to be whoever, you know, the nice one is. And, you know, th those sort of things, that's not how we operate because that's, there's no better recipe than to, uh, than, than that to shut down someone. So we start with listening and what we, the reason we do is because we hold that there's a, a, a relationship between listening and telling. And that, that re relationship is reciprocal, meaning that the way you're listening to me right now is shaping how I'm speaking. So if, if suddenly we had a technological problem and I couldn't hear you or you couldn't hear me, that would be an obstacle to listening for us. And we would have to stop, right? Now, that sounds pretty easy in this context and that example that I gave, but think of the number of people you've seen do presentations and they sort of put their PowerPoint up and they barrel through it, right? And the only goal is to get to the end within the five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes I've got. And so you've lost all your listeners because you're not paying attention to the listening. So that's where we start. What are the obstacles that get in the way of your ability to listen to others and to listen to yourself? And the number one obstacle that comes up is judgment and self-criticism. Those kinds of things are really big barriers to your own creativity, as we all know. And there's no reason why that wouldn't be the case in business. So we start with listening. And once we've sort of you know, leveled the playing field and cleared the slate a little bit, and we know what the obstacles are, and we've raised people's awareness around this, now we look at, the, at what is your message? What are you trying to tell your audience? And what's that human value or theme or even maybe human emotion that this is conveying, right? So if you take a, a, a security alarm, uh, an, a, an alarm for the home, for example, security alarms for the home, uh, you know, there, I, that theme or value is gonna be safety or something around safety. And close to safety is the opposite of it, which is that you feel unsafe. So now we have, a, we have a, a sort of lead in terms of what kind of story should we tell? We want to show this audience how you're going to take them from feeling unsafe to feeling safe. And that's very universal. That's very human. We're not going to take the audience through all the features and technical data of this product and why it's such a great product. We've got to hit the themes of those emotional things that human beings feel. And once we've got that theme and everybody agrees on it, then we looked for the lived experiences. What's happened in your life that shows me this from going to unsafe to feeling safe, right? And in telling the story, this is the next cornerstone of it. You have to be able to answer the question, what happened as you craft your story? Every story is about what happened. And that sounds pretty obvious. But what's really hard is that most people will talk about what they felt about something that happened, what they thought about something that happened, what their interpretations were, what their opinions were, and none of that is a story. None of that is something that I can wrap my head around. Most people will say things, well, you know, I, I really felt like I needed to go in a different direction in my life. And... Uh, I, I needed a change. And so, you know, I took an action and that action led me to, I don't know what the story, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> and I've heard those words so many times. It's like talking to a best friend, right? You can do that with a best friend because they know who you are. But when you don't know your audience and your audience doesn't know you, you've got to give them the facts of your life, the facts of your experience, right? And so, so that's kind of what we, the discipline of it. And then we look at structure, you know, and what elements do you have? But from a process point of view, going from listening to then finding that value, finding the lived experience, and finally, you know, really shaping it as what I call a what happened story, as opposed to all the things that go on in your head. That's what we really want to get to. I, um, 
I definitely um, feel like storytelling is something that I personally lack in um, myself. And I think it's that latter part of what happened. And mm. so for me, just for, for our conversation here together, help me dive into getting good at the what happened. Yeah, well, think of it as, as a camera that's following you around. Okay. And that camera, it can hear, it can see. So it's like you're in your own documentary, basically. And you've got a crew that's going around and following every, every move you make. And so they can see everything, they can hear everything. But this camera is particularly smart and clever because it also has the three other senses. So it can touch, it can smell, it can hear. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, how, many how many senses are there? Five. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so all five senses are, are there, including what goes on in the body, inside the body. So I'll give you an example. I, I had a career switch, um, right, when I was uh, in my late 20s. So I went from finance to then going into film, and then finally, that's what led me to, to where I am today. Now, I can tell it to you exactly like that, right? And, and before I started to look at the what happened, I probably would have said something like, to the extent of what I was talking about earlier. I'll, I'll tell you all my feelings and thoughts about this, this period of my life. But what actually happened was this, is that on a Monday morning, after one of our Monday morning meetings that we always had, I went back to my desk and I typed in three words into my search engine. One was film, another one was business, and another was New York. Technically that's two words, so four words. And, uh, and then I, got my third cup of coffee, it was 10 a.m. And, uh, and then I went into my boss's office, his name was Lawrence. And I sat across his mahogany desk and he said, do we have a meeting? And I said, no. And he said, well, what, what is this about? And I said, Lawrence, I quit. And six months later, I'm in New York City and I'm blah, 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 blah. So I can go on with that, right? But that's the difference. And that's what we're looking for here. So when you ask, you know, how do I get good at this? It's like you're noticing what's in the environment exactly like you would if you were the one holding the camera, right? It's easier for us to do this for other people because when you witness what's going on with somebody else, something happens in the street or at your favorite coffee shop, you're probably going to go and tell your friend, oh my gosh, you never... You, you'll never guess what happened today. Someone slipped on a banana peel and then the ambulance came and all of that. And there was coffee everywhere. You can describe those details and that's what's engaging your friend, right? So in a business setting and when it's you, you have to put yourself in that position too, where you sort of take a little bit of distance from what happened. And you have to, what makes it easier is that you have to identify those moments that carried an emotional value for you that were that kind of resonated with you something you're never going to forget basically um i'll never forget you know the 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 look on my boss's face when i told him i quit i'll never forget you know that i had three cups of coffee that day that you know it was a monday morning meeting like these were other things that were important to me at the time and with a little bit of distance i could realize that and i could see that and so once i know that then i can look at well what exactly happened what was my desk like? What was the view like? Um, you know, what did my boss say in return? You know, what did I say? These are the kinds of things that you, you and the more you do this, by the way, at the, at the beginning, it's very hard because you kind of have to go back in your memory and it's a little bit like exercises a new muscle, exercising a new muscle. Uh, but the more you do it, the more you'll notice that your memory is actually going to get better <laughs> and, and more details are going to come up for you. Um, so, but I think the analogy of the camera is, is really the best thing. You know, if, if you, uh, Ali, have, have a, a particular, um, you know, sense that for you is the thing, you know, if you're a visual person, or maybe it's about scent, whatever it might be, then go there, go to the, those moments in your life where something happened for you and you're never going to forget that image, go to that image, right? And then think about what the message is that you wanna that you wanna convey to your audience and really unpack that image. What happened right before that image happened? What happened right after? You know, and then you just keep going and you you can never get stuck because you keep asking yourself, what happened? What happened next? What happened next? It's deceptively simple. 
That explanation is the um, the best explanation that I have had in how to like unpack a, the story um, in the what happened. So thank you very much. Mm, that was incredibly work. helpful. Um, I often wonder when I'm listening to stories, because I do appreciate a really good story and um, go like, why can't I, why can't I tell stories that way too? And I think you've just, you've just kind of nailed it. It's like the camera of being in the moment with them and them describing it enough so that you can understand it and almost like get there with them. Yeah. Um, in business, what, when is a story not okay to tell or what type of stories do you, you suggest people not share? Mm. That- well, you know, the first question that that's part of our process actually is asking why do I need a story and why now? So that when you answer that, you, you, the, the implicit part of it is that, well, maybe it's not a time for a story. And, and it's hard for me to answer that in a very general way because it's a very personal choice, right? It's sort of like, what, but you can, but I, what I can speak to is how to get to a response <laughs> and how to sort of figure out whether it's a good time to tell a story or not. So okay. first you, you, you start with that question. You start by asking yourself, why do I need a story and why now? Is there an opportunity for me mm-hmm. to engage my audience in such a way that I know that I'm gonna engage that thing in their brain that's gonna make them want to know what happens next. So if I have uh, a presentation that's you know, really um, heavy on data and feels a bit dry to me, probably a great time to tell a story, mm-hmm. right? Something to illustrate it, something to bring it to life. If, and now the second thing, if I look at my audience, so first is the topic, look at the topic and see if there's an opportunity for a story or not. And, and do we, because we use stories in order to engage others and to connect with them. So, so that's really what you're looking for in terms of that, that content that you've got. If it doesn't naturally have that, then yes, a story would probably be good. If it already is very, very engaging and maybe a story just repeats what's already there, maybe you don't need a story. So that's the first thing is the content. Second thing is your audience. And that's probably the most important thing, knowing who you're talking to. Uh, if this is like the 10th time that you meet with your investor and they know the story, they know all the things, they know that they're going to get their ROI, they've already signed on the dotted line, you know, and now what they want is to know the numbers, right? Probably not the best time for a story. Right? You're just going to talk about the numbers with this person that you already know. So these are just examples, but I think it's up to the person themselves to sort of gauge whether or not it's a good time for a story. I don't think any type of story is, is inappropriate as long as you are relating it to your audience and to your topic. If it's got nothing to do with your topic or nothing to do with your audience, then definitely mix it. And the best way to know that is to is to find somebody that you trust to try it out on on other people and ask them what you're tell them what you're looking for in terms of feedback. You know, I, I'm here's who I'm going to tell this story to. You know them as well. I want to tell it to you so that you give me a sense of whether this is a good story to tell or not. So I think the practice really does make perfect, and and it's it's best to practice these things rather than trying something you know, for the first time when you're not completely sure. Right. I, um, I run engagement programs over the years. And one of the, um, one of the sessions that we do in small groups um, of leaders is we do a storytelling component of it. Mm -hmm. And so I've listened to a lot of stories and um, of people sharing. And it's often the first time that they are sharing an experience because we ask them to pick an experience that, um, is maybe a challenge for them to share, but there was a good outcome to it. So um, it is interesting to see how people pull the component of stories together and mm. how incredibly powerful that can be. Yeah. Could you share with me, because I know that um, an area that you focus on when you're consulting with people is how stories can impact teams. So um, if someone has not thought about their story, how can they consider doing something and what kind of impact could it have? Mm. Well, I'll, I'll give you a, an example. Um, 
you know, I, I worked with a with a pretty big uh, health insurance company that's got offices all over the world, and uh, and they had just created a, a, a team engagement initiative, where they had sort of uh, gone through like a rebrand, and they had these seven brand attributes or values that everyone you know sort of lives by essentially in that organization, and they noticed that these weren't really landing with their employees. Employees didn't quite know how do we live by this and what, how does this work? And that's when, you know, we proposed uh, a storytelling engagement to kind of bring these attributes to life. But instead of going to the leaders and saying, you know, you came up with these or the branding agency, you came up with these, let's find stories that are going to bring this to life according to you. Let's go to the employees and ask for their stories um, because they're the ones who are on the front lines. They're the ones who are living this message day to day, and they're the ones who aren't quite getting it. So that's probably going to have an impact down the line on your customers as well. And so we, we went and we asked them, you know, we created these, uh, these events where essentially getting back to your question, how did they sort of come up with their own stories well, they had a framework, right? So we had these seven attributes, you know, for example, one was we listen to our clients always. Another one was we deliver wow moments. There's a lot of companies that say things like that, but how do I know that you're, what does that mean to you? And so we asked them to tell stories from lived experiences with customers, you know, where they experience that, they experience delivering a wow moment. And what does that mean to them? But the challenge was because of our what happened camera, they couldn't use those words. They couldn't start the story out by saying, so I delivered a wow moment. No, 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 you're gonna to have to tell me what happened. <laughs> and then let me come up to, with that conclusion, come up with the, with the knowledge that, oh, that's what they mean in terms of delivering wow moments. And the impact of having all of these employees come up with their own stories well, it was very empowering to them. And they felt like the company had given them a voice that they didn't feel they had before. You know, we, we traveled in tiny little places all over the US uh, and, and people just weren't used to it. They were just thankful that we were there asking for a story. But because we did it within this framework, it was easy to kind of see what that impact might be. And for them, the impact was that many people uh, we started making videos of these stories and we um, distributed them on their internal channels. And those were the most commented on, um, you know, things that they had ever seen uh, in terms of, of uh, the engagement of it. And, and then other people started to put in their stories, even though they weren't part of the program, right? So, so that's the kind of impact is that you see this dialogue happening and you see that it sort of spreads like wildfire once one story gets out. Other people, it makes you think of your own experience. And as a result, you want to share your own experience. Because even if there's 10,000 stories about delivering wow moments, that's great because they're each different. They each show a different aspect of what that means. Um, so you can never do enough of it, essentially. What a great example. Um, how did, in that particular uh, example, so they created videos of the shared stories and then what did they do with them then? So how did they transfer that into where other people are participating? Yeah, so, so yes, so, so that was the process. We started out by you know, working in groups mm -hmm. uh, a few hours each and, um, and by the end of that engagement, about a half a day, uh, people had stories, they had created stories and then we, we filmed um, those. And then there was, uh, after that, they distributed them on their, uh, uh, on their intranet, essentially, um, mm -hmm. a kind of a YouTube channel, but just for the company. And they asked people to vote for their favorites, the ones that, and not just like, uh, you know, oh, I prefer this one because of the way he or she is dressed, you know, kind of thing, but, uh, but really around certain criteria, you know, did it bring meaning to some of these attributes. What were some of these attributes? And then the best ones kind of made it to another, another tier where those now were seen internationally. They weren't just seen nationally. And then they opened it up for comments on this, uh, on this kind of YouTube channel. And that's where they had a system by which people could actually upload their own 
stories in response to that story. So they had created, you know, the seven attributes, the stories. So here's the message. Here are values. Here are the stories that represent these. Now, what's your story of representing that value? So essentially, those became models for others to emulate. Very fun. I mm. thank you for walking me through kind of like what that actually transpired into. That's very yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, what is the um, what is your story? Mm. Well, uh, which one do you? <laughs> I have many stories, but uh, well, you know, the one that I I find myself telling these days um, is well, part of it is is what I was saying earlier, this career switch, uh, but. But that was, you know, that was back in uh, 2003. And so what I, what I tell these days is that I, I'm very big on uh, uh, employee engagement, as you know, we've been talking about this. A and I sort of am intrigued by the ways that companies engage employees. And, and at what point is there an opportunity to engage employees in such a way that they're going to feel that sense of belonging, they're going to understand your culture, and they're really going to perform really well for you. And to me, that's the onboarding, uh, you know, that, that first week, that first month, that's when you've got an opportunity to really engage people. And so the story that I find myself telling is this one. I, when I came out of business school, um, I had a job in finance and, um, and I came up to this and I, and I was hired in a company in Hong Kong. Um, and so I came up to the 15th floor of this building, beautiful glass building floor, overlooking the Hong Kong Harbor. You could see mainland China in the background. And, um, and I start to go towards these, this open desk with the, with the floor to ceiling windows because they had told me that's where my desk was gonna be. And then someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, oh, welcome to our bank. And uh, uh, I, I'm the, the HR director. And, uh, and I said, oh, well, I think I know where my desk is. Is that where we're going to go? And, and uh, she says, well, that is where your desk is, but that's not where we're going. And so then we turned around. And the more I followed her, the darker it got. So there was less and less natural light until finally we got to a room, which was a tiny room with just two chairs and one table. And she handed me two heavy binders and said, could you get through these in the next 48 hours? And so I did, one was uh, an employee handbook and the other one was compliance. That's what it said on it. And so I went through these and it was about a week until I met another person who was even remotely relevant to my job and role. And then every six months, someone would walk into my boss's office and say that they quit today. And they'd come out with these huge smiles on their faces. And my boss would inevitably say, well, that must be because others pay better. My hands are tied, headquarters won't give me more money. And then lo and behold, I was the one going into his office saying I quit. So that's the story I tell these days because there was an opportunity to engage me on a level where the stories, I didn't hear any stories that first week, that first month. And the only reason I stayed more than six months, unlike others, is that I had someone within the company who was my guide and that I was lucky enough to find. And he's the one who told me the stories about Hong Kong, where to get your suit tailored, all these things, where the best restaurants were, not just about the office, but everything, uh, all these cultures that I knew nothing about. So, so that's, that's, where, that's where I go these days because I'm kind of an advocate for people looking at their onboarding processes and yeah. engaging your employees at the outset. I can't stress that enough. You've got such a great opportunity to do that. Yeah. And coupled with your examples, I think that that's a great also onboarding tool as well. Mm. Jerome, fantastic. Thank you for sharing both of your stories. Sure. Um, where, um, where is the best way for people to connect with you and find you? Well, the best way is our website, um, narrative.com, N-A-R-A-T-I-V.com. It's always a little tricky because it has only one R and no E. Uh, so it's not the traditional way to spell narrative. And, and we have a blog um, where we post a lot of articles uh, around these themes that, that you and I have been talking about and other themes, uh, which essentially take you through all the applications of storytelling. Um, we also have a book called Powered by Storytelling, by Murray Nossel, who's the founder of Narrative and my business partner. Uh, and that's available wherever you find books um, on Amazon and other places. Uh, so I would say those are the, the two things that I would point people to. 
Fantastic. I will make sure I uh, put a link to the book in our show notes as well, because um, I'm going to put that in my Amazon cart as well. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Right. Jerome, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing the ins and outs of storytelling. You're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you.